Ah, okay. Just just a little technology thing going on. Thank you. Hey, welcome to the Journeys webcast. I'm Alan Carl, your host. Uh, it is the 38th episode of this uh, Journeys webcast, and I started this back in the beginning of the pandemic as a way to connect with people all over the world because I was in uh, lockdown, cabin fever, and um, craziness. Um, but now here we are. It's kind of seeming like we're we're starting on a new journey. We're starting this slow journey to open up. So anyway, I'm so excited to have an encore performance with my guest today. So this is going to be very, very ex exciting. So just a couple bits of uh, technology stuff while we're doing it. There is a chat over there. I can see uh, Barbara. Great to see you. Uh, Bo, as we know, I think, right? Sora, lovely. Bruno, nice to see you. So great that you guys are all tuning in. And I'm very, very, uh, man. We're going to talk about this. You guys have no idea. So if there, for some reason, the, the screen gets jittery, uh, freezes, bad sound, there's a little red button uh, or bar in the top of your screen. It allows you to kind of reconnect. Um, that's uh, that that's uh, how you can kind of solve that problem. Um, all right. Sandy Rock, good to see you. Ha. Ah, hello. Hello. Um, use the chat room uh, on the side uh, for sure. Um, and, uh, if you have a question for Phil or for me, there's a little button down there that lets you switch from chat mode to Q and a mode. So you can just, it'll help us flag it down in case there's a lot of chat. Um, but we'll see how that goes. Um, I, I, I wanted to check in with, 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 with everybody. I, I, I hope people are seeing that light at the end of the tunnel. I hope you've gotten the jab and, uh, you're vaccinated and you're able to, uh, kind of see that that things might um might move maybe maybe i'll have be able to get on a on a plane sometime soon even go to a place like rome and see phil in person uh just to to see some normalcy in this world but anyway phil was was a guest with me back in october uh or november um and uh i'm gonna so, so there's been some new things happening since he was on here. So I want to tell you a little bit. If you don't know Phil Palmer, this guy is a true legend, but a humble legend at that. He comes from um, London, England. He's world-renowned session guitarist. He's a producer. He's a music director. And he's been in this business with a career that spans more than 50 years. You can find and hear Phil in his legendary guitar playing and tone on more than 5,000 songs, get this 500 studio albums and over 50 number one hit singles. He is the author of Session Man. This just came out uh, last month. Uh, it's a tell-all memoir from his days at the dinner table with his infamous uncles, Ray and Dave Davies of the Kinks, to the rock and roll riot lifestyle of an exclusive and highly sought after session guitarist and touring musician. He's famously collaborated with some of the most prominent artists in the music business, including Paul McCartney, David Bowie, Frank Zappa, George Michael, and many, many more. He's uh, he is the call on guy for um, man, Eric Clapton, Mark Knopfler, Dire Straits, um, touring musician. He's played for the biggest names. And, and not only that, um, uh, Tina Turner, The Who, and we mentioned George Michael. He, uh, Phil actually served as the musical director and performed with the Strat Pack, okay, which is a collection of some of the best guitarists in the world for the 50th anniversary celebration of the Fender Stratocaster, which, by the way, was developed, invented just about 50 miles from here in, in uh, Fullerton, California. Anyway, it was a star-studded co concert at Wembley Arena in London in 2004. In 2002, he was... Oh, man, this is this is incredible. He played the infamous Party at the Palace as a member of the house band for the Queen's 50th anniversary rock concert held right there at Buckingham Palace. He grew up in the shadows and influence of rock and roll pioneers, of course, with his infamous uncles, Ray and Dave Davies of the Kinks. He's married to an Italian singer and television personality, Emanuela Palmer, more popular known as Numa. Together today, especially a lot more in, in lockdown, they collaborate and are involved in several humanitarian projects, including UNICEF and others. Join me in welcoming Phil Palmer to the Journeys webcast. Come on in, Phil. 
Let's let's get the right. show on the road here. Can you see me there, Ian? Hey. Can you hear me? We can okay, hear you. Good. This is fantastic. Um, tell us where you are. What time is it? And give us a, 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 an idea for the for the, the global audience. Hopefully, we're getting right. tuned in here. Okay, it's just after midnight here. It's dark, as you can see outside. It's been a nice day. Um, spring is here. Uh, the streets are buzzing. There's lots of people around. People have had their jabs, and we're getting back to some kind of normality, and it feels really good. That's that's fantastic. Um, you know, we chatted and had a great time uh, back in whatever it was October, back back when there was no activity on the streets, back when yeah, was, you know there was, was quiet, so much yeah. uncertainty. Yeah, um, and and uh, since then though. You know, this has been a work in progress, I know. And and you were working on it uh, back when we chatted last. But uh, the book is officially mm -hmm. out. In fact, in the sidebar over there, for those of you, we're going to talk a lot about Session Man today. I am going to put up uh, a link to the Phil Palmer website where you can actually order this book. So if you look in the set, and for those of you who happen to be watching this on the replay on YouTube, I'll put the links below in the description so that you can uh, click on that and get to Phil's website and uh, order his book. It's available now worldwide. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm so excited. I, I wanted to kind of start out today, Phil, and I'm going to pull up. I'm gonna, I've got a cheat sheet here. Um, I wanted to, okay. to, to, to give a little my quick perception about, about Session Man, okay? It's okay. got it all. Yeah. It's got sex, drugs, rock and roll, of course, camaraderie, infidelity, excess, and adventure. And it's got, it covers the, you know, a, a lot. You get into the pressures of uh, months long touring and also a balance of fitting in as a hired gun with a, um, as a session musician, contributing to the sound and the feel and the groove of many, many, many songs and albums for a career that spans. Yeah. 50 years. It's also brutally honest, transparent, and shows a lot of humility. Um, I, I, I really enjoyed the book. It's packed with crazy stories, honest reflection, and hope, for sure. Would that be a good way to, I don't know. Yeah. And uh, That's pretty much it, yeah. Yeah. I, um, you're, you know, there's a little bit of a challenge with the Wi-Fi, and Phil, Phil's image may pop off every once in a while, but he is with us. Uh, no question. I'm still here. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I want to start at the end or, you know, or where we okay. are now, actually, because, because you know what, at, I'm fond of saying that the, at the end of every road, you, there's always a new beginning and, you know, you, the book ends where we're in lockdown and, you know, you had, um, you had been, you were in Miami, you were getting ready to, to launch a tour with the, uh, with the Dire Straits Legacy and um, a couple of your bandmates, at least one of them, um, got put into a hospital in Miami and probably yeah. COVID related. He was in intensive care and, and then you, you hightailed it back um, to Rome. We had to, we didn't have a choice. No. Yeah. And, 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 you know, at that point, you say in the book, clearly it was a ghost town. It was eerie. Um, and was, and yet yeah. and one of the things that I, I took away from that, you know, starting at the end is that you have this lesson on, on maybe what what the life or the lesson uh, life lesson of uh, maybe of all the years in the studios and the stages that um, that you found a being locked down kind of in a, a tranquility and um and that the not that it was a new new reflection but you came down and you said uh, the importance of good friends and trusted colleagues I, I i'd love for you to to share a little bit um about those thoughts yeah it was it was a tough time initially um when we got back to rome it was as i said a ghost town there was there was nothing happening at all. We couldn't get food. You know, the, the, the supermarkets were, you know, uh, were, were, uh, didn't have any stock. And if they did, then you had to queue up for two hours to get it. <laughs> so it was it was a difficult moment. Um, we were living off Lent 
bottles and stuff and the things that we had left over in the in the cupboard. Um, but we started kind of straight away. I, I got into a quite a serious fitness regime, um, and um, I uh, I started Tai Chi and stuff like that. And I've you know once I could get out again, I started doing a, a regular. Uh, walk uh, six kilometers walk every day and um, then start gradually we started to use the, the internet to, to contact people and, and start doing um, sort of streaming events uh, and online sessions and, and bits and pieces like that and online lessons too and I, I established a network of, of guys that I, I students that mm. um, became uh, a couple of them become good over the last year. I mean, one guy called Lance who lives in Washington. Um, he, he's joined a band since I started working with him, and um, you know, it's, it's very encouraging. It's nice to be able to share that kind of experience that you know you, you've accumulated over so many years, and you you kind of take it for granted, but. Once you start sharing it with someone else, then you start to understand that there's something to give. And probably the same, same feeling with the book, because mm. uh, as I said in the book, I never thought that I was important enough to write, write a book about. And yeah. um, it's not until you start looking back at yourself and start researching myself as I did, that you realize that uh, there's, there's a lot of stuff there. You know, when you're going through a career like, 50 years it goes flashing by in, in, in sort of <laughs> you don't realize what's just gone you know it, it, it was interesting and, and very uh, rewarding to, to, to look at it like that yeah you know you also in lockdown had to and not only embrace the technology you, you started doing things Casa Palmer you know live streams uh, on Facebook and mm -hmm. as you said doing these lessons but you you had to embrace technology that really you have seen usher in throughout your career. And that is the idea of remotely producing and playing and collaborating mm. with people. You you did you during lockdown here um, produced and played on Renato Zero, if I say his name right, Renato Renatato Rentato Zero's new album. Renato and Zero. Renato Zero, okay. That presented a challenge, but at the same time, there was some reward to that, wasn't there? There was, in, in lots of ways. Um, uh, necessity is the mother of an invention. Is that the, is that the right expression? Yeah. Uh, we, we um, yeah, Alan, Alan Clark and I started to, to write together a couple of years ago. And um, with the lockdown, we, we found it quite obviously challenging but we were sending songs backwards and forwards to each other to to work on and once we uh once we actually started to put the tracks together i've, I've got a little local studio uh around the corner called biscuit studios which uh, i use for everything that i do really um mm -hmm. and once once we were allowed out uh, i had to get a little letter from uh, the local council to say okay i'm going to work you know i'm going to the studio to work and in case I got stopped by the police, which I never did. But um, so I was popping around to Biscuit Studios and Alan was at home in Manchester and we were writing songs and sharing the files backwards and forwards and developing ideas. And then we started playing them to Renato and uh, we got his feedback and we were able to develop them further. And then we, we said, well, why don't we just do the whole album like this? And we, we did. Um, so I was putting tracks together around a biscuit. Alan was adding his strings and keyboards in Manchester. Uh, the bass and drums were done in Milan. Um, and, um, basically Renato did his vocals at home. Uh, he's got a little pro tool set up at home. And, um, so we, we, we didn't share the room at all. Uh, and we, we, we developed the whole album like that. We, we had one great kid. I, the only um, travel expense for the whole album was a, a very <laughs> talented engineer that I worked with in, in real world studios in England called uh, Ollie Jacobs. And I flew him over and I gave him the, uh, 
the very difficult task of co collating all this information from all over the world and, and making a record uh, for like, you know, it, it, in a di very difficult way. I mean, it's just complicated to, to try and put all that information together and make a, you know, a record out of it. But we got there and um, the results have, have been really amazing. That, that, that's uh, that, that's amazing. I mean, just the, the thought of that, the scope of that, you know, and I know it's done in, in, in crazy times um, where, where people do that, but you, you know, that this is where I want to kind of go back. And, um, and in fact, here, humor me for a minute. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you remember these things? Tuning fork, my God. Yes, tuning fork. That's before we had, you know, yeah. kinds of <laughs> digital tunes. Yeah. Which so, I don't trust, by the way. Right. You don't, I, I'm going to, that's where I'm going. By the way, this might look like a Martin, but it's not. It's a, about a 40 year old Takamini that uh, was before they were sued by Martin to stop copying their guitars oh really they got uh, sued yeah or maybe it was a cease and desist but it was yes yeah. there was some litigation um you, you you have this um and and i'm gonna pull my note up here because you, you have this uh, i i bring up the tuning fork because it is so analog it is the way that people tune pianos still to this day a lot well the real great piano tuners do um and this is a cheap little, you know, this is probably not a, 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 a great one, but that is a 440. Yeah. But, you know, tuning and harmony, you know, my my book, my book, which is uh, famously called Forks. And people always ask, oh, it's forks. So what are the forks? And I always say it's there's three. There's the forks on the motorcycle, of course. Then there's the forks we eat with to to nourish our our soul. And then, of course, there's the forks in the road when we come to those crazy decisions that we need to make in life. But then there's the forks that we keep tuned that give us harmony. You have this fascination with math and mathematics and physics. And, and you, you talk in the book about how the guitar is really this kind of, of a perfect instrument, at least in terms of the, you know, the, the, the layout. Um, but you also say that it, it's imperfect status with you is you've never found a guitar that had the perfect tuning or intonation or up and down the neck. So before I go into this more, I want to ask you, have you ever broken a string tuning a guitar? Uh, probably. Um, if it was a, you know, sometimes you get a, a duff batch, a batch of strings or something that, uh, but I, no, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Probably. You know, the, the reason I say this is I'm, I'm not a, you know, a, a classically trained musician. I don't have that natural ear is that I, um, you know, sometimes I'm trying, I mean, when I tune the guitar without the, the aid of a device, and I'm just doing it by ear using the harmonics, um, I get to the G strings. And I can tell you probably in my life, I've probably broken a dozen G strings trying to get it in tune. And, and part of that is, is probably my ear. And I'm like, and, and, and I'm just trying to make it, maybe I'm going too sharp, too sharp. But you tell in your book, and this is fantastic, that, that there's only one string that you have a bit of a problem with well you know one string but you know the g string and of course without the sexual innuendo i won't go into that but you compensate for this weirdness of the g string by tuning it a little flat and then this blows me away that you are compensating by finger position and that's within a fret you know to 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 get that 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 string not sharp but you know on that's yeah Tell me a little bit more about that, because this is something, it's a little geeky guitar thing, but... It is, it's, it's geeky, and, and the, the older I get, the more experienced I get, the worse I get, because uh, <laughs> it just drives me nuts, you know, I've, I'm pretty lucky at the moment, I've got one of these things, which is a, a, a Maton, it's an Australian guitar, and they really make a good guitar, and they go, you know, they go... They make it nice. That sounds great, you, even over this streaming. <laughs> and um, but yeah, they call apparently it's called unconscious tempering, 
And it's something that um, violin players and viola players do all the time. Um, but it is, it's just a compensation. So, I mean, for example, if I tuned this G string slightly flat, I'm, I'm unconsciously tempering the G string with my index finger there. To bring it back. To, to, to bring to, it to back. Take, take, take the flatness out, yeah. And that's how I do the other thing. That's my chorus pedal right there. That's <laughs> You don't. You don't need the box. You, just you don't need, need it. it. No, you can do it with your, with your arm. Yeah. Uh, this. This is uh, for those of you that are not guitar players out there, and 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 I don't put my myself necessarily in that category. I, I hack on it a bit, but but to, to you know, starting new guitar players always have a challenge just getting their fingers around the neck. You know, let alone doing this conscious tempering. Tampering. Um, Fantastic, but um, this this kind of comes to um, to a point. Um, you know, back as you were thinking about writing this book, you you talk about um, being in Rio, not Rio. You were in Sao Paulo, I think, and it it was the middle of the night, and you felt you saw your life flash before you, and yeah. and what did that trigger in you? This 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 dream or nightmare? Um, initially, it, it it scared me a little bit because you know seeing your life flashing in front of your eyes usually usually uh, suggests that you might be near the end. But um, no, that once I got over that initial shock of it, it was a very strange experience. I can't really explain it. Um, it was I was in a hotel room. It was three thirty in the morning. We'd just got back from a gig. And we had to leave again at 5.30, you know, two hours. So we had two hours to lie down and get ready and stuff. So I, I was, I packed my bag, brushed my teeth and laid on the, on the bed with my clothes on and ready for, you know, to go again. And it happened then. And it was a very strange experience. Um, it was almost like a trance, really. Um, and I was able to, um, to control it. It was like I had a, a remote control where I could fast forward and go back and and check something out slow motion. I was just it was a quite an intense experience, and even aromas and and stuff and and sounds and feelings were coming flashing back to me of of when I was like four years old, um, and um, I liken it. It's like if someone's opened a door, right? And you, and you go inside the door, and inside there, there's other doors. And I just started opening all these doors, and all this information started coming out. And um, I started to write it down on my uh, on my iPhone, and um, and that was the start of the book. Yeah, yeah, and and that 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 impending kind of you know you you opened up and and you meant you talk about this in the book about feeling oh I'm not I'm not important enough to to be writing about my life, but yet mm -hmm. here you had this fast forwarding and all of a sudden this rush, you, there's, there's maybe you feeling it's a harbinger of doom or, you know, the, the mortality, the notion of mortality becomes a little bit more concrete and yeah. you, you got to just jot that stuff down. So yeah. that, that takes us back um, to your, to your childhood that I want to now kind of go by. Cause, um, and, and this is, this is fun stuff and i do have some video stuff we need to get to but i'm i'm just so excited that that coming off reading this book um learning more about you know how you ended up being this um really you know uh, you know a guy who's been on so many so many so many music collaborations it's just it's just crazy mm -hmm. but you you had a friend in your childhood as you started um I think you said your mom gave you a ukulele first because you were too small. You couldn't get your fingers around a guitar. Um, That's right. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and well, I see that you're drinking something and I, you know, normally have this. So I'm going to open up this bottle of Chardonnay as I, as I ask you about. Go for uh, it. I'm, I'm drinking water and I'll probably have a cup of tea in a minute. Okay. 
you, you, I want to talk to you about your friend Brian and okay. and about and and there's a reason for this because I'm going to show something. A big Bill Brunzi. Hmm. You might might explain who Big Bill is for those who don't know. Maybe. Well, um, God, I don't know so much about him really, except I guess he was around in the forties, fifties. There's a there's a bit of uh, there's a bit of footage of him playing in a nightclub in in Paris, which I love. Um, and he's singing a song and playing a song called "Hey Hey," and um, I don't I don't know how I I first heard about it. I mean. It must have been on the 78 or something like that, on an old, an old record uh, that I first hear, heard him. But he has this technique that I found really fascinating because it sounds like he's, he uses the, the acoustic guitar as like a, a drum and a musical instrument both at the same time. And it's a, a, a particular technique which I've, I've been trying to, to master ever since. And I still, you know, I still dabble with it from time to time. It was an early, um, early uh, glimpse at the blues for me. Because, okay, Let's yeah, see if I can, I'll probably mess it up, but. <laughs> <laughs> Too difficult. It's too difficult. I've been messing around with that ever since I was about eight, and I still can't do it. But um, yeah, you, you you talk about uh, 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 a Davy um, uh, Graham, oh, like Davy Graham, and, and the song Angie, which is not yeah. the Rolling Stones song Angie, if it's a no. big bill. Yeah. Um, so as I as I was as I was reading this in your book, it, it sparked me that that. Um, uh, two brothers here in the United States, a guy named uh, Phil and Dave Alvin. I don't know if you know these either of these guys. Don't they were they they were with a LA band called the Blasters um, back in there, and uh, Dave's got a solo career now. But they did a whole album uh, of Big Bill Brunzi songs. Now right. Dave, the guitar player, yeah, Dave's the guitar player. Phil is the uh, uh, is the singer. And I have a very short clip you're going to appreciate. So check this out. Here we go. Okay. Oh, we should turn our mics up. Oh. You survived death to meet Big Bill's guitar. That's really something. It's like holding, it's like holding Big Joe Turner's voice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's all right. Maybe I will be up someday. That's amazing. Turn your mic on. Turn your mic on. Turn your mic on. There it there is. That's are. classic Alan Carl, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so that is that is Bill Big Bill Brunzi's guitar. And no. it's in a museum in Chicago. So Get they were actually here. playing. Get out of yeah. here. Yeah. Wow. So that's why they were having that look, and he, and, he, and he says it's like holding Big Joe Turner's voice in my hand, he says. Yeah, uh, I, I, I so. think I would get the same feeling if I had, was able to play it. I had no idea that, yeah. that his guitar still existed. Um, I must make a, 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 a visit to that place. I'd love to see that. Yeah, it's it's, it, I, I think it said it in there. I'll put a link in the description too, but it's, uh, it's, the, it's the Museum of Folk Music in Chicago. That may not be the official name, but you, know, you can Google that. But uh, there mm. it is. Wow, and, that's uh, fascinating. Yeah, so those, 
Yeah, so those two guys did do like a tribute album to to the to the songs of uh, of him. So it was apropos that that they had this opportunity. Um, but um, uh, enough of Big Bill. I, I wanted to um, uh, talk about uh, speaking of you know old stuff as we were you know talking beginning about making an album remotely. But Dave uh, Davies of the Kinks, your uncle. Um, <laughs> He was quite a fiddler, and there's a there's a there's a great story um, that he may have invented two things. You want me to tell you about it? Okay, yeah. yeah um, my, in my gr- grandmother's front room, um, and was, we had lots of parties there. Well, they had lots of parties. I was a kid, um, and we had a big family. Um, Ray and Dave had six sisters, one of which was my mum. And um, so the, the Grand's front room was the kind of meeting place for the, all the family every, every week, every Saturday. But Dave also used it as a kind of uh, workshop for messing around with, with guitars and amplifiers and stuff. And he had a soldering iron and um, he'd found this funny little amplifier that he loved the sound of, very distorted. And he, he said, I love this sound, but I want it to be louder. So he kind of, um, he got this soldering iron, he soldered a wire onto the back of this this little amplifier and plugged it into an AC-30 and invented the preamp. (laughs) (laughs) And also, you know, controllable distortion, which is, uh, you know, the Mesa Boogie did it 30 years afterwards and, uh, you know, made a fortune. But, um... I think, you know, the, the sound of You Really Got Me was kind of born in my grandmother's front room, you know. <laughs> you know. He was playing through this little little amplifier and then going through an AC-30. So I believe he invented the preamp and heavy metal music at the same time. <laughs> it, 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 it's, a, it's a stunning story because that is, that, that kind of distorted, that You Really Got Me uh sound of the, of the original we're not talking the van halen version the original no, Kings the version. One. You know, yeah. yeah um yeah fantastic um of stories now you had a a bit of a falling out with with dave and i i wanted to come back and ask you you know you in in the book you say and you can you can share this story if you wish that you after this falling out you never did talk to him again is is that still as uh, I didn't for uh, probably let's see uh, thirty years. <laughs> I didn't see him any ever again. But recently, I guess it was just before lockdown. It must have been, um, or in fact, uh, it was maybe last summer when everything was sort of sorting itself out in England. I went. I went home and um, I had a cup of coffee with with Ray and bumped into Dave, who was. Um, who was around and um I, that's the first time i've spoken to him since then yeah so it's 1975 until last year wow it's it's it, it, it how do you feel about that i'm uh, st- stupid i mean yeah I, it, it hurt at the time because you know he was such a hero of mine yeah. um I, I i must have got him a, a bad time he'd just come back from an american tour and uh, I was dating his au pair, who became my first wife. And, um, what was that? Hey. She's having a conversation, I mean. <laughs> it's like, uh, she's, she's, she's very, got, she's got very, you're very animated, I'm sure, over there talking. <laughs> she's, can, can you hear that? Because I'll tell that again another. Yeah, it's coming through, yeah. Good morning. Morning. We can hear you. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. So I was talking about Dave, and um, and yeah, I I was in his house when he came back from an American tour, and um, you should read the book really because it yeah it explains it a little better than I I I'm kind of prepared to now. 
Yeah, needless to say, it was a, it was a, it was a, it's a, it's an epic point in in, in the book. So, uh, but I'm happy that you at least, you know, in that in that period where you you were hanging with Ray, you did get a chance, and and hopefully that won't be the last time. There'll be more. No, I think he's he's living in London now because he's he's been living all over the place for the last thirty years or something. You know, yeah. but I'll probably see him again. Yeah. So, um, you, you, as, as your guitar collection grew, um, you know, one of your, one of your first guitars was an EKO that had, uh, that was a 12 string, but you, you, for whatever reason, it you know, had it strung for just six, which by the way, the very first guitar I ever had in a, in a, a, a girlfriend loaned me over a summer was a, was a 12 string, but she put just the six strings on because I, I had just learned, started learning chords. Yeah. So, so when I read that, I was like, I know that. I know that. Um, you, you famously, um, and the story's in the book, I'll, I'll just share it really quick, is, uh, is that you sat down with the Cream uh, album, the classic um, song called Badge, and you painstakingly learned, you know, this is before tablature was uh, very, very yep. famous, right? Yep. You famously learned to play that note for note um, and, and, and fast forward some, I don't know, 20, 30 years later, whenever it was, you're in, you're in Argentina, you're at river plate, the classics, you know, football team, river plate stadium on tour now with Eric Clapton. Mm -hmm. And you, you have to tell this story because this is fantastic. Well, I mean, by that time, the Eric's band, that was so good. I mean, every, everyone in the band was wonderful to play with. And uh, so consequently, things kind of evolved spontaneously uh, during the tour. And, and, and that at that gig, during the sound check, Eric turned around to everyone and, and said, does anybody know the song Badge? <laughs> and um, we, we kind of roughed it out in, in sound check. And he said, let's do it tonight. I said, Eric. Would you mind when we when we get to the second solo if I can play the solo in the second part of the song? He said, "Yeah, go ahead." And um, so I, you know, I was I got all excited about it, and um, we we played the song, and you know, without any kind of rehearsal, really, we just did it. And um, I played the second solo, and I played Eric's solo from the original Cream version, which I'd learned sitting on the floor in my mother's lounge when I was 14. And there's a lovely moment. You, it's, you can see it on the video and uh, where Eric is suddenly realized what's going on. And I'm looking at him and he's looking back at me and smiling. And it's it was just a lovely, lovely, warm moment. And uh, it's it's on film. I mean, the great thing about this book and a lot of the feedback I'm getting, which I'm really excited about, is that people can actually see what I'm talking about in the book. And so you get you get my impression of what happened and their impression of what actually uh, happened on the night. And it, that kind of feedback has been really interesting for me. Um, wow, I hadn't realized that was... Um, uh... I, I I think I might be able to pull this up. Let's see how good I am because um, this one it's it's pretty grainy the the, the vid, but uh, it, it's out there somewhere. Is it um, is it nineteen ninety? Yeah. Okay, wait a minute. Let's see if this is it. No, that's not. That's there is a full concert. Um, there is a full concert, so I don't want to. I don't want to take too long to find that song. It, okay. uh, but uh, but I do have. I want to play a video right now of um of a, a, a little medley that uh, I put together from um many links that uh, actually Bo sent me and uh, there's others I dug up dug up. So okay. let's let's play this one. There's a few here we'll play through that our conversation, but let's go ahead and do this one. I'm gonna turn my mic off. Okay, me too.
<laughs> I love that. I enjoyed that, man. Oh, I've never I never seen too. some of that stuff. That is just legend. That lay down, Sally. Come on, I'm that just like a that that groove. I just love that. Uh, yeah. Um, and, and, and it's and it and it's curious. I you Pete Townsend's has been a hero for me for 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 years. The Who is just you know sits as one of the the all time. Um, greatest and and you had a chance to actually record he pete has a quite a, a cool interesting studio uh out in the countryside and um you visited there to to work on something and um and he, as he was giving you a tour he, he took you by a display case and um people that know the who if you don't know the who uh pete townsend was very famous for not number one windmill guitar chords you know, he just swing his guitar up and down. But then the Who were notorious for destroying their instruments. Something John Hyatt years later would say, you know, perfect would wrote a song called Perfectly Good Guitar about uh, about breaking perfectly good guitars and, and and of course Keith Moon kicking his drum set to shit. But it turns out this was never planned and 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 you had the opportunity to hear it from the from the man himself. And I I'd love that story. Yeah, I was surprised by it, but it, it, there's a outside the, the control room in his studio in his house in Richmond, which is in London actually. Oh. Um, it's um, there's a as a as a display case with a very broken Rickenbacker twelve string in there, and it's all in bits, and he never had it put back together, of course. And uh, the headstock's broken off and the strings are hanging down. It's like a piece of art, really. And he said, yeah, that, you know, that, that happened by accident. I said, really? And he said, yeah, we were playing in a, in a place with a, with a low ceiling and I was jumping around as I always did. And the guitar got stuck in the, in the roof of the stage and I couldn't get it out. I was pulling it and trying to get it out and, as I ran, yanked it out, the, the head broke off, and and he said, and then the crowd went crazy, <laughs> and they thought it was a kind of <laughs> a deliberate thing. He said that was my favorite guitar. I loved that guitar, and I've broken it, but the crowd got, went crazy, so we we kept it in, and it became it became the Who thing. I don't know how how true this is, but that's what he told me. Well, you know, there's the old adage, you never let the truth get in the way of a good story, but it yeah. sounds good. <laughs> it does sound good, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's for sure. So uh, Townsend also, I, I guess you, the, the pinball wizard we saw, which was at a, um, uh, I, I forget what concert that was, like uh, uh, Roger Daltrey was doing the songs of, of Pete, I guess. and That's uh, Carnegie Hall in New York. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Carnegie Hall. Are you kidding me? Yeah. Um, and uh, Pete was supposed to play that part, I guess. I Yeah, I just, it's a bit vague. It's a bit gray, this this story. But um, I, I'm not sure if there was some kind of contractual issues going on. But Pete had hurt his hand, his right hand, doing a windmill. And apparently the, uh, the whammy bar from his Stratocaster pretty much gone through his hand there and <laughs> and he was, it was all bandaged up but he was at the side of the stage and he was there uh, but um he said um oh, i have to teach you the fingering for the beginning of pinball was it because you're gonna have to play it i went i'm gonna have to play it and um so he, he talked me through it a few hours before the gig and um it's not like complicated but that 12 string I was playing was rented, right? That's a Takamini 12 string, and it was a pig. <laughs> <laughs> it was a horrible yeah. guitar. And there was no guitar. action, right? It was, it was like an inch off the keyboard. <laughs> oh, it's a real pig. It's a tough one to play, but... <laughs> Basically, yeah. So I need a pick really to do this properly. Oh, here you go. Thanks, man. <laughs> <laughs> so something like this. Thanks. 
session. It is a fast rhythm too. Not only the this fingering at the beginning, but when you go into the you know the, the... it's a tricky little thing. But that's what Pete was so clever with. I mean, you you start to analyze his tunes and stuff. There's very intricate and very clever fingering going on in his tunes, and uh, he loves things that have uh, common notes, and that's a very good example of it. You know, you use the common notes in the chord. I love working with Pete. He's a genius. Yeah. You, um, in, in the video I just showed, there is a, um, a segment where, where you is, I believe that is Lay Down Sally you're playing, and it's uh, with a full orchestra, and it's part of the um, Royal Albert Hall, uh, Eric Clapton's 24 Nights, where he, he broke them up into bl classic blues, a nine piece, and then yeah. with an orchestra, yeah. which, by the way, you know, was orchestrated by the amazing michael Kamen, who you have so much there's 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 so many crosses with michael and we we'll talk about that in a bit mm -hmm. but i i know that, that that growing up you know you had a bit of hard time um with your dad who used to call your uh dancing with music industry becoming and you know using that as a profession as a music lark um yeah. and and you know, at one point he he tells you you've got to uh, either get a real job or get out of my house, find your own place, and yeah. and yet several years later, it's at those concerts where the orchestration is conducted by Michael Kamen, or maybe not conducted, as it turns out, <laughs> um, that uh, you 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 kind of set up something uh, for for the, for the pre show and post show with parents, and it, it's such a warm story. Um, and, and, and before you tell that story, cause this will lead into it and it'll help you there as a band with that great band, uh, Eric Clapton's band, you had a ritual that you would do at the end of every night and yeah. including at the 24, tell us about that. And then tell us about your, your dad. Okay. Um, the band hug, um, we would just, uh, before it comes and after we would, uh, we would just assemble in a, in a little group and 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 have a little kind of um a little hug and, and kind of a prayer but not not a religious one you know eric would say something like thank you for bringing us together to play music and um, and, and let's all have a great time that kind of stuff so this thing went on and i still do it we still do it today because uh, it's, a, it's a nice it's a nice thing to do it sort of I don't know, it gets you prepared for the for the gig. Um, and then we did it uh, uh, after the show as well. And that that was the night that, um, because my dad and I didn't really get on after that for about 20 years after he threw me out of the house. Um, <clears throat> and so I thought, okay, this is a very good opportunity to uh, – to invite mum and dad to the gig. I, you know, I still find this very emotional, you know, and I'm not sure if I want to do this, but. Um, okay. I, you know, you, you know, it, it was emotional for me reading it. So uh, it, it, it's, it's a, it's a really, you know, a beautiful moment in your book, but yeah, we but, can move on. Uh, yeah. It, it's, it's, <laughs> I fall yeah. apart every time I think about it because it was such an emotional moment, but uh, yeah. it's, it's a nice thing in the book and um, you know, if people want to read it, it's it's, it's, it's a, a real life thing. Yeah, it, it's tough as to say that that uh, Phil invited his parents to 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 that amazing arena, and and uh, you need to read the story for sure. Um, you know, you've worked with so many great producers and in so many incredible studios, like the studios of Mark Knopfler. We talked about Pete Townsend, even in the early days with your uncle, the conch, you know, Hansa studio in Berlin. Yeah. There was Richard, Richard Branson's manor studios, ad vision, Olympic Cherokee caribou ranch, you know, yeah. Yeah. Um, George Martin's air studio, David Gilmore's Hook End, Mont Knopfler's British Grove, Metropolis, even the Forum Studio, right where you are now. I don't know if it's still there, but uh, yeah, it is. In, in in Rome. But but you do have a a point in the book to talking about how record labels are closing and studios are closing. You know, based on this um, this new world we live in. 
and I, I, I can't, can't imagine, um, you know, that environment. I mean, you, you talk about, uh, at one point, um, going into a studio and you can remind us there and, you know, the, they're, you're, you're going to play and Simon Phillips is doing drums and, and they're, they're setting up his drums and trying to mic the drums. He's got eight toms. You yeah, know? two bass drums, <laughs> eight times, yeah. And and you turn around and you look at the desk, which for those of you who don't know in the in the industry, that's the mixing console. And there is a character there. And, and I and I'd love to go into a little bit about this. Yeah, it was a bit of a surprise because um, the um, it was just another session. You know, it was uh, a. a a wet Monday morning in London and uh, we'd all been booked to do this this session and uh, there was Dave Marquis who was a big friend of mine, a bass player, and Simon Phillips and a, a keyboard player called James Lascelles. And so we were booked to do this session. We had no idea what it was about. We just showed up and set up and got ready and um, and then sitting at the desk, I'm just looking for the picture, man. There he is. Sitting at the desk was <laughs> that guy. And if you can't see who that is, that's Frank Zappa. And he was the producer. And it was a, it was a bit of a surprise, um, you know, because he was known as, you know, his, his work was really complex and difficult. And there's, you know, us four kind of, English session men that you know suddenly confronted with this musical legend. It was a bit of a surprise, but actually we got on great. I must say he was um, he was really nice, and uh, he was very encouraging and very supportive of what we were trying to do. It was a strange album um, for a, a guy called El Shankar who went on to do lots of stuff with. Um, with Gabriel, Peter Gabriel and stuff. Um, but just a, you know, a real great player. Uh, and he he brought these a couple of songs which were based upon an Indian raga. So they were complex in the extreme. And uh, it took us a few days to, to figure out how to play them. But um, once we did, they were great. Yeah, if, if famously you mentioned in there that one one of the uh, songs uh, you did, how many takes? I mean, it was in, it was like over thirty takes or something like. It that. was seventy, I think, in the end. I mean, <laughs> sort of abandoned attempts at this song. It was so difficult. It was every other bar was a different time signature. It went from five eight to four four to nine eight to eleven sixteen and. You try to count it, it was like a math lesson. Um, but in the end, we, it was impossible to count it. So we sat down and we, in a circle, and we, we did this sort of routine with just <laughs> clapping, the, you know, trying to get all the accents in the right place. And it, it worked in the end. It was a difficult, difficult song. Interesting solution to a to a tough problem, huh? To 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 do it that way. It's the only way you could to do it was to feel the pulse of the thing, um, mm -hmm. because if you tried to count it, you, you'd never. Well, we couldn't do it. We just couldn't. Yeah. Do it. Um, I I uh, I've got a note here because you just let you know you led me into. Uh, uh, a topic I think that I should jump into now instead of later. I don't know we're going to get through all of this stuff, but um, um, you you talk in chapter thirty six. Okay, I pulled it up of um, of the soul of music, and you return that again in one of the ending chapters of the book as you reflect on changes that we're talking about in the music industry, you, you say that there are no shortcuts and how auto tune is, um, is taking the soul out of music. Um, and, and I thought it really interesting. I'd like you to talk about that because this is something I, you know, with modern pop music, I, I, I find the same thing. You know, I, I, I feel songwriting and performance 
has to come from a deeper space than just a mathematical chart uh, or an idea that you're trying to, like a dartboard, you're trying to hit a certain mark. And and for for me, that that's how I um, the the music choices I listen to. And when I write my songs, they they're by no means coming from anywhere, but but some sense of soul. And and when I hear some of the music today with the auto tune and uh, just the overproduction, um, yeah, I, I I I felt you and I were on that same page there. And and a little bit later, you talk about working with Trevor Horn, the great Trevor Horn. Um, and and I forget what the project was, but I know it was a Bruce Springsteen tune, I think called Dancing in the Dark. And and how that song, you know, in 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 in, in you can you can share the story in its minimalist production with Trevor, you know, what kind of talk to me about those two things and how they do intertwine, I think. Okay, yeah, the um Trevor put a a list of songs together he was he was talking about doing a, an album called the 80s reinvented or something i think it was released i'm sure but that song didn't actually appear on the record which was a shame because um the demo he put together was sung by a guy called guy garvey and guy garvey is in a band called elbow okay and um I was completely blown away. I mean, I've always been aware of that song, but it wasn't until you kind of break it down to its raw bones that you understand that it's a great song. And uh, that for me is, is the kind of, um, that's the, uh, the way to tell a great song. If you can play on acoustic guitar or piano and it sounds interesting and good, then it's, um, it's a good song and it's, you don't need to do anything to it. And that was definitely the case. The way Guy Garvey sang that song and he lived it. He didn't just mm. sing it, he lived it. And that, that for me was a real indication of what soul is. I mean, because he got into the song like a, almost like an actor would in, into a part. He became the song. Um, big lesson, you know. Um, if a song is great, it'll stand up without any production at all. It's just a great song. Now, the, 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 um, the auto-tune thing is, is a different kind of... I think what I meant by that is that um, it's people have used auto-tune now for a long time, and uh, but I, I started to hear kids singing live that sounded like they were... They had autotune on their voice, and I'm I'm looking at them, saying, "Where's the autotune? These people are singing live." And they, I think the point I was trying to make in the book is that uh, we are starting to emulate a computer rather than a computer emulating a human being. It's it's a very interesting moment for me because you know they've learned through um, you know just by listening. To, to recreate that sound and it's a it's a very interesting evolution if you like of uh of the human voice that you said evil did you say evil evolution <laughs> evolution yeah yeah I, 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 I don't think it's it's soulless it's just it's cheating that's all i well yeah uh i mean i mean for 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 somebody like me who can't sing it, you know, in, in tune at all, you know, put on the auto tune and it'll, it'll jump my voice to the thing. But I, you know, in my own little home projects, nobody ever gets to hear them, but me, I, I, I take it off. Cause I just don't, it's, it's, I guess it just still doesn't work for me. I'll, I'll listen to my own, in, you know, bad intonation, <laughs> but there's um, something about it. it. It makes, if it's something, if it's too in tune, if the voice is, too perfectly in tune it becomes an instrument rather than a voice you you uh, it brings up the the point of the, the the pro tool setup under george michael's stage uh, not only <laughs> him not only george <laughs> sure i'm sure i'm sure yeah. um but yeah people uh 
you know, singing along with themselves, pre-recorded parts on live shows. Um, you know, I mean, it's been going on for a long time for sure. Um, but uh, I doubt Eric Clapton would have ever done that. Um, no. Yeah. And neither did uh, Dire Straits. I mean, uh, yeah. what you see is what you get. And I think that's one of the beautiful things about going to a gig. Because uh, you get the warts and all, you know, you you get the mistakes, or you get the slight variation in the, in in the arrangement that um, maybe only ever happens once, and you just happen to be there. Yeah, you 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 talk about Eric Clapton being that way. You know, if if there's a mistake, there's a mistake. Like I, he goes somewhere and he he can't really figure a way out. I I use my own term was painting himself into a corner just because you know. It, he was in that moment. I, I think you say his his work, his guitar playing doesn't come from here. It comes from here. You know, the, the well, it comes from here. It comes from well, here that. and goes down there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it yeah. Doesn't of go anywhere it's soul. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. It's not it, preconsidered. It it just happens. Yeah. You you worked quite a, a bit with George, but we're going to move on to go. I want to go back into the early part of your career where you were a, a session musician. I, I you talk in the book about the first time you could uh, you could afford a uh, a car, which would enable you to to schlep your guitars and amps around town and do gigs. And you ended up um, building a relationship with David Essex. And I didn't know much about David Essex to be honest with you. I knew the song rock on uh, because it was a big hit here in the U S when I was a kid. And for, for all I knew, he was kind of a one hit wonder. Cause I never really, he never came on my radar again, but it, but it turns out he was an actor TV star. He did a lot of other things and, and very visible in London. Um, and there's two points I bring up this, this tongue, you know, which one relates to the, to, to the, the paradox of a session museum, a session musician. And, to the generosity and kindness of some people within the industry. And David seemed to be one of those. He definitely was. I, I love David because, you know, he was just a, a normal guy, really. He, he was a lucky boy. He was a good looking kid. He wrote okay songs. He sang okay. Uh, but he knew, he was one of the first people that I, I worked with that had had the idea of uh, camera craft, if you like. He was good with he was good with an audience. You know, he was his acting side was was useful for him because it covered up some of his deficiencies, shall we say? Mm. Uh, uh, he, he was a, a, an okay singer. He wrote pop songs and had a, a massive kind of teeny bopper female young girl following, and. Um, I started working with him in 1975, I think, and I was looking to buy my first apartment. And um, I needed I needed some money to for the deposit. I had organized a, a mortgage for myself, and um, I needed a deposit. And I was chatting to his secretary, who was a lovely lady called Madge, in their office down in Baker Street. And I just said, I'll, I'll go, I'm going to try and raise my deposit on for this flat because I want to buy this flat. And um, kind of the next day, I had a call from David in the morning saying, I, I hear you need 1,250 quid, uh, which is 1,250 pounds. doesn't sound like a lot now. And I said, well, yeah. He said, here it is. I'll give it to you. Uh, and you can pay me back out of future gigs. And uh, with that, he signed a check and gave it to me immediately. And I bought my first flat. It's it's a it's a great heartwarming story because you you had finally figured you could buy this place, but where were you going to get the money? And and you you know uh, gigging you know as a session guy as a session man is like freelancing say in many industries as a writer as a photographer as uh you know any in the, in the creative arts it's it's and you use the term you know it's common feast or famine right yeah. you get a good gig and then you don't know when the next one's going to come That's um, it. but there's a interesting story with david you you share um about um um the bass riff 
on um, on Rock Rock on. On. Yeah. yeah, who 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 you say we we don't know. It's not clear. You know, this is not one hundred percent clear. But you know, it's p- believe maybe David Flowers, uh, Her- Herbie and, Flowers, Herbie Flowers. Thank you, yeah. Herbie. Yeah. Herbie, that's right, Herbie Flowers. And um, <laughs> he may have uh, written it. And and that's really the most catchy, iconic part of that song. And would, would David give recognition that would lead to some royalty possibilities for Herbie? Which, interestingly, you know, he also wrote the bass line for Walk on the Wild Side. That's right, her. he did. <laughs> Which, you know, you have a very funny story about Lou Reed, the AKG 414. I mean, yeah. I, I mean, that's a, isn't that a studio mic anyway? I mean, it's more uh, tuned to us. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyway, we, we, you guys have to read the book for that one. Okay. That's a, this is a little side thing for us. Yeah. But, but, but this, but this session man bit, you know, about, um, playing on some iconic songs. You know, I, I have a friend, you know, I used to, in my, my marketing years, I was, I, I ran an advertising agency and I, um, you know, I, I, one of my clients was Tascam. So, you know, I kind of brushed in and out of, uh, some people that they kind of supported and, and with their technology, the D88s and things like that back in the day. And they're one of their, uh, one of the guys working there was a guy named Roger Maycock and, and Roger famously told me the story that he was a drummer. It was, you know, he is a drummer, but he couldn't make it. So he just went into business and, and got a job at a music related company, but he had a session as he was working in New York and he got a session for a, for a, for a band, which was, wasn't really a band. It was just a song that was being programmed called wild cherry. And there was a song there, play that funky music, but boy, you know, the song, right? Yeah. Um, he played the drums on that, on the recording. Oh. And he told me he got 150 bucks. I think it was 150. I, I may have the numbers wrong, whatever it was. It wasn't a lot. And, you know, that song went on. Who knows how, how that was, uh, how, how long that, uh, uh, how, how many things. But uh, the reason I say that is, you know, you also had a great 17, 18 year uh, still going on with Krista Burke. Um, and you talk about Lady in Red, one of, one of his many big hits, but that was very big. Uh, but as you guys were recording it in the studio, um, you made a contribution that maybe was more than, than just being a called hired gun, right? It, it's a strange one. It's a gray area. I, I think, you know, I've spoken about it with other musicians for the last 30 years. There's no solution to it, really. Um, basically, as a session player, you're expected to contribute something to the session, you know. When it crosses the line into a musical development of the song or a fundamental element of the song, as in Herbie Flower's bass riff, then, you know, it, it kind of should be shared, in, in our opinion, in my opinion, anyway. Uh, and it's up to the artist to, to make an offer. And if they don't, there's nothing you can do. Um, and I can sit, there was, a, there was a George Michael song that I played on, on Listen Without Prejudice, which needed a middle eight, it didn't have a, a bridge. And um, they, uh, George said, well, what would you do there? And I, I gave a few suggestions and um, it became part of the song, but I never, I never followed it up, you know, in terms of publishing or royalties and in the end you know it, it could be an unpopular thing to do you know after the event to say to the artist you know what i actually put that bit in there you know i i did and because yeah, yeah. you know it, it could backfire and um so i never did but yeah. there you go but but you ended up having a relationship for 18 years with with george and and toured with him extensively globally and, actually 30 yeah. years i worked with george until he died yeah 30 years wow yeah, yeah. so so to to tap step into that area you know you you it, i know it is it is such a gray area but you you talk about something that i never heard about i don't know if it's it happens in the us but it's this um um uh, what did you call it? Um, PPL. Yeah, yeah. That that 
that had been in there from the 60s, but there was no way to explain what that is and why it never really worked out until late. Uh, it was, yeah, it was this weird one. It was an idea put forward by the British Phonographic Industries, BPI, um, where they suggested that um, if a musician played on a, an original recording of a song, the studio recording of the song, they should get some kind of royalty for it. Um, and like much like a PRS royalty, like a performance royalty that the, the songwriter gets or the artist gets. But it was never, um, it was too difficult to distribute um, until they computerized the system, which happened, I guess, in the early 90s, something like that. But in, a, in the meantime, since the 60s, they've been collecting this fund of, of royalties that was supposed to be distributed to the musicians that played on the records. Right. And at the when I first heard about it, um, it was apparently £66 million in this fund, which they they had to distribute to all these people that have been playing on these records for the last 30 years. So it wasn't until they, they computerized the system and started to identify who played on the records that they were able to distribute it. And um, that's when it started to get interesting for people like me because, I mean, it's a tiny percentage of... Uh, of the royalties that are, that are given out when a, 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 a song is performed or played on the radio, tiny. But right. if you do a lot of them and it's a 5, successful 000. record, <laughs> there you go. Uh, and, and it's a successful song, like for example, Lady in Red, um, it can be quite rewarding. And it has turned out to be in the end, thankfully it's my pension. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. It, so in, in that in that sense, you know, here you are a session guy, feast or famine, you know, thankfully, David gave you this, you, you, you kind of got your foot going, you're, you're cruising through your career. Um, but as a result, you, you know, as I said, at the beginning, you're very sought after and people were uh, booking you right and left and you were working really long days. Yeah. And you were you were I, I don't rem remember where you were, but but a, a producer that you you worked with who called you PP Deke is was his name. I don't remember his Deke. last name. He yeah. was a manager. He was the manager of Sheena Easton, and he gave you some proper advice, didn't he? He did. Yeah, he said, "How are you doing, PP?" And I said, oh, "I'm a bit a bit knackered, a bit tired." He said, well, you know, you're working hard. I said, yeah, I'm working a lot. I'm doing sort of 18-hour days some days. You know? He said, well, you know what you should do, son? He said, you should double your fees. And I thought, that's an interesting concept. But I did. And uh, it, it, it eliminated, it did two things. It eliminated some of the work that I I probably wouldn't, need to do anyway in the sessions that anybody could do and made me kind of exclusive at the same time and it was a, it was a great thing to do i mean uh, i recommend it to anybody but um <laughs> it basically i i i doubled my fees and um i was working half as much and earning the same except after a few months i was working 18 hours a day again but I've become exclusive, and um, and it was the, one of the best bits of advice I've ever had from anyone in the music business. It, it there was a um, there was someone else, and I in in right now I I don't remember um, who it was, and and you'll you'll fill me in. But in in this this idea, um, as we're going down this road of of, of you know how do you earn money as a, as a, in a feast or famine freelance kind of a, a environment that uh, somebody said that, well, he makes more money while he's sleeping because of songwriting. Who was hmm. that? Do you, do that you was know? Uncle Ray. Oh, that was Ray, okay. That was Uncle Ray Davis, yeah. And it was just, a, you know, over dinner one night, he, he said, hey, you, know, I'm, uh, you know, I think I was probably complaining about having to work so much. He said, well, you should start writing songs because you earn the same amount when you're asleep as you do when you're awake. He said, it's brilliant. <laughs> And and so you you famously collaborated with a guy named Tony Colton and yeah. um, 
you were working with Tony, writing songs, and then one day out of the blue, he disappeared. And and to me, this is this is a great story and kind of brings you into this songwriting realm. Yeah, Tony was in a great little band called Head, Hands and Feet in the 70s. And uh, the guitar player was Albert Lee, who, you know, you know Albert Lee, great country picker. Um, and Tony, I mean, the band broke up for whatever reason, and Tony was a bit kind of damaged by the, his life in the, in the music business. I think it was probably alcohol, probably drugs, probably both, I'm not sure. And, um, but he had a, a nice little family in a, <clears throat> in a three bedroom semi detached house in East Finchley, which, uh, was a pretty non eventful place, really. Um, and I used to write songs with him. We used to, used to share ideas. I'd spend an afternoon around at his place and, uh, we'd throw songs together. And he was kind of natural. He was a bit of a natural, you know, he would just, he was, had the ability to pull songs out of thin air. And, and make up lyrics and uh, he was very good at it except one day I popped round to um, to try and finish the song that we were working on and he wasn't there and he said his, his wife said to me um he went out a week ago to buy a packet of cigarettes and I haven't seen him since and he, <laughs> and he actually did he said um I said well something stupid like uh, oh well when he comes back will you ask him to call me or something and um, and I didn't hear anything for a few months. And then he called me uh, from Nashville. He said, listen, I went out for a packet of cigarettes. I got as far as the tube station. And I thought, fuck it. I'm going to go to Heathrow. I don't know where I'm going to go, but I'm going to go somewhere. And he got to Heathrow. He had no clothes, you know, just his T-shirt and, a, a, and a, you know, nothing, and some money. And he got on the first plane to Nashville. And he didn't ever go back. And um, he established some some nice uh, contacts with some pretty heavy um, country artists over there. And uh, he said, "Listen, the reason I'm calling you is that he, remember that song that we wrote called I 'I'm No Angel.'" I said, "Yeah." He said, "I'm in the studio with Greg Allman recording it now." And they said that was it. I mean, it, 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 that song did really well for us. I mean, it was something that we threw together in his front room in East Finchley in, in an afternoon. You know, front of those. And, and and Greg's uh, former wife Cher actually covered it too, as well later on. She right? did, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, um, it's it's a it's a it's a tremendous story. Is getting a phone call like that. I mean, it's not quite like getting a call when you're a bit younger, still living at home with the mom and dad, and the phone rings and it's David Bowie. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so so these kinds of phone calls the session man gets. I mean, these are pretty yeah surprising, right? They kind of come out of the blue like this. Uh, I guess they do, but you, I, I suppose I, you, you start taking them for granted, you know. Um, I don't know. That that was a weird one because I was still living at home. I was pretty young, and um, it was four o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and um, uh, yeah, there was a, a yeah, Philip. There's a Mister Bowie on the phone for you, and uh, it was my mum. And um, as I went down, I thought this is someone winding me up, you know. <laughs> But it was actually him. He was talking. He was calling me from Berlin. They were in the middle of a session. And, um, he said, I, I need someone to come and play some guitars. And I've heard about you from um, Tony Visconti. Uh, and I'd like you to come over and uh, get the first plane available. So I did. That was that. Was that. So, and Tony Visconti, of course, um, famous for uh, his work, obviously, with uh, Phil Lynott and Thin Lizzy. Um, I'm curious because um, I, I, I've seen, I mean, I'm sad, sad thing with Phil, but uh, I'd, I've seen Phil, uh, Thin Lizzy a couple of times. Actually, Backing Up Queen was, a, was a, a good show, you know, in between his bouts of with hepatitis. Mm -hmm. But um, but in, in his band at, at, at one point it was a guy named Snowy White. Did you ever cross paths with him? We did meet somewhere, and I don't know why. 
Was Snowy White in Elton John's band? He he could have been. I um, I know he played with with Pink Floyd, Roger Waters, and I know he did. Um, oh, he could have. So, um, but I, I think don't... maybe that's the connection. That's maybe where that's where I met him because I did some stuff with Elton. Yeah. Um, yeah. And of, and of course, Gary Moore was part of that Thin Lizzy, the the rotating guitar players there. Um, it was a fabulous player as well. My God, um, that night at the uh, the Strat Pack thing, he tore it apart, man. He was brilliant, Gary Moore. My God. Yeah. yeah, you you talk about that in the book how you were you were mesmerized, and and you also talk in the book about the first time, maybe not the first time, but but the but the first time Eric and maybe you, I don't know, we're sitting backstage at a festival of some sorts uh, and Stevie Ray Vaughan came on stage. Mm -hmm. And and I, I, uh, I Eric, Eric had, was blown away so much he had to go up to the manager, I think you put in the book, right? Is it, or, or am I, or was that you? I don't know, but. Uh, I don't know that bit, but um, no, we, we, we did two nights at a place called Alpine Valley which is a, a gig in Wisconsin, I think. So it's, it's not far from uh, Chicago. So we, um, we, took, we took helicopters from Chicago to Wisconsin for that gig and then back. And it was a, a fateful evening, as you can probably put two and two together, because that's, um, it was the night when Stevie Ray Vaughan died in that helicopter. Yeah. But you also lost something in that helicopter too. This is this is like um, I mean, I, my when that when that moment in the book, and and we don't have to talk about it. Should, people should read this in the book, but, but it it's just remarkable. Um, and and um, um, the drummer Steve Fro Steve Froney. How do we say? Yeah, yeah, Froney played with the. Petty, uh, right? Uh, Tom Petty? No? Tom Petty, yeah, for 24 yeah, yeah. years. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he was known um, as the new boy. Yeah, and, and, and you were the new boy in Clapton's band when, when he, there any, he, 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 you know, that now we can call you corporal, but it took some time, didn't it? <laughs> it took a while, yeah. That was Steve. Steve was a wonderful person, and he, he nicknamed me Private Palmer the first time he met him. I met him, and... Um, he said, listen, if you want to become a corporal, then you have to do exactly what I tell you. And I did for a few years. Yeah. Yeah. What, um, what a great, uh, what a great, uh, drummer. Um, fantastic. he's a wonderful person too. Yeah. I think there's a quote in the book where I say, Steve Ferroni is probably the most beautiful person I've ever known. And that's mm. true. And is he is he still with us? He's still is he still playing? Is he? Uh, yeah, yeah, and he's, yeah, yeah. he's uh, struggling a bit. He had a knee operation. He had uh, some uh, issues with his right knee, which swelled up like a a football and uh, some sort of uh, cartilage problem he had going on there. But it's fixed now. He's got a knee replacement. He's playing his ass off. He plays great. That, it, it was all that you know hammering that kick drum man just did a number on his knee. Yeah, no, he, he was a big guy he was a heavy guy yeah he still is yeah. pretty heavy but um i think it's a lot of weight to carry around for 60 something years for the, yeah on those knees for for sure the um uh oh uh, let's see i've got um i think we should play some music i could either play a video or you've got your guitar there you know last time we were on you shared with me your um uh how much you like steely dan you know you loved their compositions you know fagan and um and becker um mm. and it was a beautiful moment you played is there anything you'd like to just kind of riff off or should i play the video uh play video <laughs> it's too okay. late okay okay it is late we're keeping you up man let's do oh, this because because you you um this is this is another uh, me just grabbing great Phil Palmer stuff. So we'll turn the mics off and okay. Yeah. <laughs>
I um uh so so a couple things just just that um you know you had the two even though he's not French you know uh at the beginning Murray Murray Head uh who pretty much got you to love the French countryside as you talk about in your in your book no doubt and, yeah um, light went off um and the um uh, and, and Johnny Halliday, you know, just before he's going to go into, and I, 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 I cut out his vocals. His vocals are very soulful for sure, but he just takes a big drag off that cigarette before he steps up to the microphone. <laughs> yeah, he, he was hitting the Jack Daniels right before that as well. So. Oh my God, it's a, it is a pretty, it is pretty. I've never, never really heard of him, you know, my, <sighs> my, my. Uh, but I know he's really huge. Although, you know, Johnny, one of the- Johnny was known in France as. Lidol, the idol, because he was so successful in France. He he could do 10 nights in the football stadium in Paris and did. You know, sold out 80,000 people a night. And he did it <laughs> all the time. And he was massive. He was the biggest French artist of all time, I think. What about Serge? Serge, I think John was bigger. Yeah, I well, I I I, I say Serge because Serge was a you know the, both of them probably had their dark sides as as we know you know. Um, John, Johnny definitely did. Yeah, and he was uh, yeah. he was a bit of an aggressive, hard man. You know, yeah. a bit like a, a bit like a gangster, really. <laughs> it's just that that uh, I'll have to put a link to that. I will put a link to you'll see the full because because Phil. 
uh, does a, another solo on that recording as well. You you have another, you know, that's just a great, just, I mean, for me, it's good raw blues with, <laughs> with this, this, this wacky character, you know, and uh, anyway, it's, it's charming. I, um, I know we're going to wind this down real quick. And I thought what I would do, um, I have this, I was going to do rapid fire with you. Because, you know, you talk in there quite a bit about how there is a competition between guitarists, even back when you were a kid with Brian, you know, to the later day with whoever you might be, you know, in the studio with. I I, I think you you mentioned at one point, I mean, I, it, was, it was George Michael was going to have three guitarists. And you're like, for a guy who doesn't even give credit on his albums to guitar <laughs> players, let, al <laughs> let alone uh, does he does he want the guitar to be anywhere above the median line in the mix you know uh if anything he mixes them out i mean uh, the trick with playing anything for george was to stay invisible as as invisible as possible because you know the, uh, rightly uh, the, the important thing for george was george he didn't uh -huh. want anything to interfere with that you also mentioned in there just it, it reminds me um, about mark Knopfler. you said in the book somewhere that you know, you would be careful not to play any of his licks in front of him out of respect, you said, for sure. Yeah. And, and, and so there's a correlation between the two of them, maybe. You know, you got to be quiet over here, but be respectful over here. Um, but Yeah, I know, mean, I, I think I qualified that uh, by saying, unless he asked me to. Right, um, right. Because, yeah. It's nothing worse than than having you know, being in a situation with two guitar players and they're both competing with each other. I mean, uh, my role as a as a session player, certainly working with people like Mark and Eric, was not to interfere with what they did. I had to yeah. support them. I had to support them in some way to find the right area where that I could play but not interfere, and that was that was the key to it. That was the secret. Yeah, I mean it's 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 phenomenal to watch you in all these videos um, uh, at work, and I know, and I think at the beginning when I played that first video where you had Paul Carrick doing um, Dylan's All Along the Watchtower, and just wailing on that. I know that was part of a project you did with with him, and the great, great Tony Levin was in there, and yeah. and was Jim Keltner playing? Who's playing drums that, on that? That was Steve Ferroni again. Oh, it was okay. Yeah. Uh, um just just fantastic and i i've got to find that that album i'm sure it's out there um it's difficult it to uh, find spin one two yeah spin one two um but i was gonna do uh since we're talking to guitarists and you already mentioned one of them but i i wanted you it's i'm gonna just name the guitar player and you just whatever comes to mind to get into it just you know one word or a sentence or a paragraph whatever you want to say and I'm only gonna go, I got a handful that I'm gonna throw at you. Don't I'm, get me I'm, into I'm, trouble, man. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> I won't get you into trouble. Albert Collins. I Albert Collins. I don't know. Okay. Pa Prince. Pass. Prince. Did you say Prince? Yeah. Prince oh, yeah. was a, a fabulous guitar player. West Montgomery. Yeah. Yeah. JJ Kale. Inspirational from many, many people, including Mark and Eric. Robert Fripp. Potty, but very clever. I love that potty. You use that word. It would, uh, Jerry Garcia. Jerry Garcia. Yeah, there you go. Bit messy, but um, not very precise. But, you know, he had a thing, didn't he? He sure did. Bonnie Ray. Bonnie Ray's a great player, yeah. She's a brilliant slide player. Richard Thompson. Richard Thompson. I don't know much about Richard. What's the name of his band? It's Fairport. Yeah, Fairport Convention. And a great solo career. Is he Scottish or Irish? I mean, I'm sorry. The, you know, you get up in those areas. I I, I, I can't remember. But uh, I have to uh, pass. I don't know where he's from. Scottish. He's probably Scottish because, um, yeah, Scottish. Yeah. Mark's Scottish too, right? No, he's he was born in Scotland, but he lived his whole life in newcastle or around newcastle area so it's just south of scotland okay two more roy buchanan 
Roy Buchanan, big inspiration for me. Um, there's something flashing up on the screen. Uh, so yeah, it's just, just giving us a warning that. I, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, Roy Buchanan. I love what he did with the, that Telecaster of his. And there's a lovely story that I heard about him um, because he didn't take much respect for that guitar. And he drilled. Have you heard this story? He no, I've a, never. This he drilled a hole through the headstock of his 1953 Telecaster, right through there, right? Because he used to hang it on the wall. <laughs> I love that. I love I, that. I, I, I love that story too, because you, you do share something in there about Joe Walsh and, and you having a newfound respect for just, uh, you, you actually talk about this in the book, but, but how Joe just showed up uh, for maybe it was the Strat Pack thing and, um, and he didn't yeah. have a guitar or amp and he's like, anybody got one? Yeah, and, pretty much. Yeah. Um, okay. Last one on the guitar thing, buddy guy. Funny guy, yeah. Again, okay. uh, great, great player. Yeah, yeah. A lot of these guys. Um, so, so now we get into a couple. This is this is the the pop, the chewing gum part of the interview here. Um, uh, favorite Clapton song to play, maybe or to hum or whatever. Um, hmm. pretending was a great tune. His, I used to love. There's a song that we played at the Nebworth concert, Nebworth concert called Tearing Us Apart. Oh, yeah. And everybody was dancing, including me. Uh, and we had a, a dance routine worked out for that song. It was a great tune to play. Yeah, and pretending rocks too. That's true. That's, yeah, that's, a, good, that's a good opening song too, huh? That it right? was, yeah. It was a brilliant yeah. song, yeah. Okay, what about Dire Straits? I still love... The epic uh, stage arrangements of a few of the Dire Straits songs, we still play them today with the legacy, but Telegraph Road is a, is a proper musical journey. It's like a, it's like a movie, you know, and mm -hmm. I, I, I think a lot of Mark's songs are like little movies, you know, they're, they're great stories, they're lovely journeys through a, a, a song. There's Private Investigations is another one. I love oh. to play that song. Just because the, the dynamics of the thing are so extreme, it's a, it's a fabulous thing to play. Yeah, there's a I'm, I'm, and I'm I'm pulling into my memory of reading the book. You 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 are performing um, as part of a festival, I think, and there's a lot more people out there than I may be mixing two stories up, so it's okay. But you will correct me. But you are sitting around saying, "Well, how." we don't know how this is going to go right with the legacy and you somebody rec recommends that you open with private investigations which is totally you know antithesis or to what people would think right because because it wouldn't be the the mark yeah, would never should, open to that no you should start with a rocker as, as you know get wake up the audience whatever but alan clark came up with the idea that the original uh, cable player from dire straits he said, let's, let's start. You know, this is our first gig at the Albert Hall of all places. I mean, that's another story from the book, but, um, yeah, it was, uh, we, we were nervous because we were, we had no idea how people were going to react to Dire Straits music without Mark Knopfler, which is what we were doing. And so I know I, everybody was aware of it, but not saying anything about it to each other. So we started with um, we started with private investigations at the Albert Hall, and it was full. There's a lot of people there. There's like seven thousand people in the room, and uh, and they all went very quiet and very. You, know, <laughs> it, it, uh, you could hear a pin drop, you know, all through the the quiet sections of of, uh, of the song. And we finished the song, we got through to the explosive finale of, of the song, and there was a moment of silence. And then the band kind of looked at each other, <laughs> thinking, what the, what's going to happen? And then the audience went nuts, and it, they, they, they cheered for probably three or four minutes without stopping. And it was, and we were kind of stunned, really. We had no idea. 
it was as good as any kind of reaction that we got the dire straits and that kind of gave us the incentive to uh, to carry on with it which yeah, we're still you, doing yeah so you had most of the um or at least plenty of the original touring band from the, the on every street tour um and you know i uh did ilsley play at that one or uh no he didn't play that one he although he's been with us in various places over in the world yeah, uh, yeah and you had mel collins yeah and even even pick withers um I, I, I'm curious, uh, my, my brother, my late brother, Bob, passed away uh, several years ago, was a huge music fan. And whenever Dire Straits come, came up, you know, the first three albums are his, and his, uh, you know, thing where, where Pick Withers was the, was, was the drummer. And, he, and, he, and, I, and I, I, I never really had a chance to ask him, you know, what was it about Pick Withers that you, 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 you always thought, you know, you didn't mention, you know, anyway, go through the thing. So, but he did play with you guys a few times. And how yeah, is this? How, what'd you think of his, uh, his drumming? <clears throat> um, he's not a groove player and um, he, he plays the song. He gets involved in the arrangement and he does strange little fiddly things around the arrangement. But, you know, it was amazing because the first time I remember playing Sultans of Swing with, with Pick in our band, it was, it was instant. It was, you know, authentic and a bit lumpy from a groove point of view, but it worked. It just worked perfectly. And uh, he was great at that stuff. The trouble with Pick was he, <laughs> he refused to play any, any dire straits that he hadn't originally played on. So the gig that he did with us, we, we couldn't play money for nothing because he refused to play it. That's insane. Yeah, that's, it was, that's it, crazy. You didn't play on the original. You anyway. have to play money for nothing if you're going to do course. that. Of uh, course. Yeah, oh, come on. Um, you know, Walk of Life. Jeez. You know, I think uh, he might have played that. I think he yeah. did play that, yeah. So uh, we're winding down. I, I've kept you up so long, but there's, you know, and I didn't get to, you know, we didn't even get to talk about um, your your role as a guitar tech with your uncles um, and and the crazy partying of the days, but people can go to the book for that. Yeah. Again, and that that link is in the description below. It's also here for those of you who are still sticking around. Um, uh, I'm going to read to you a handful of venues that you played at, and where would you love to play again? This is this is like, and now I'm going back to my to my real handwritten notes: Buckingham Palace, Earl's Court, Carnegie Hall. Uh, Madison Square Garden, the Felt Forum, Wembley, um, and then there's a hot tons more, but those are the only ones that, that got there. But but some of those are are iconic. Yeah, Royal, I did say Royal Albert Hall, of course. Yeah. So, what? Where would you know? Where would your last gig be? I it would have to be the Albert Hall. I have such great memories of playing in the Albert Hall with Eric and well, with lots of things, but. Uh, uh, it, it was a joy to play there with Eric Clapton because it was so relaxed. He was so relaxed. Um, and it was, you know, inventive. It was uh, spontaneous because you never knew what was coming with Eric. And that was the great thing about the band. Everyone was good enough to follow whatever he, whatever tangent he went off at. And uh, that was the fun of it. It was the seat of your pants, really. Yeah. Um, speaking of that, you brought up, uh, and this this will be a good way to wind this down. Um, when you said Eric Clapton uh, was very relaxed, he gave you uh, his own bit of wisdom, um, which related to how to how to to be relaxed. And after fifty years, uh, you could share with us what he said. But you also in the book mentioned after fifty years, you finally you really have come into where you are just you're comfortable it doesn't matter if there's a you know you try to quantify how many billions of people have watched you on tv on stage through mm -hmm. record records um that you're finally you know relaxed yeah i love it i mean i i guess at one point in my career i did get nervous um but it's beautiful being able to walk out on the stage now with no nerves whatsoever and no know your instrument so well that you you're just confident uh, you can you can try things out because you know you're not going to fuck up 
you know, it's just a, it's a lovely feeling. And that's, that I learned that from Eric, really. I mean, that was, that was the big lesson learned, you know, standing behind him for a few years. It was spontaneous is, is the thing that I love these days. Yeah. It's, uh, there's a, I, I, my performance, my playing, if you will, is uh, I do speaking, keynote speaking, and in front of I've I've spoken as in front of as um, not nothing like like you, but as as little as a group of twenty to uh, a group of uh, like eight thousand, and um, and as I was you know getting my craft, I'm a storyteller. I um, I came across a quote from Sir Anthony Hopkins, and. He said, um, uh, rehearsal is the work, performance is the play, you know, between the difference of work and play. And, and for you, you've obviously had 50 years of rehearsal um, and, and, and it, it is play. And, and, and even though you've played, you know, obviously uh, with that. And I, and I think I, as, I, as I read that about uh, Eric's quote where, where he, he said, you know, uh, the, the, the key to relaxing is uh, uh, that, um being more relaxed is being more comfortable but nonetheless i i thought of anthony hopkins and i thought how um being able to go out in front of a group whether you're phil palmer alan carl or just somebody watching this webcast and you have to be in front of an audience doing whatever it is um is that to make it comfortable and relaxed is is to rehearse practice but that when you're out there, it doesn't look like you're playing a, off a script. It's natural. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. That really is, yeah, the bottom line for me is, I think it's, I hope it's come through in the book, but uh, spontaneity is, is, the, is the key for me. And the things I do just by trying something out is, is the thing that excites me most these days. Yeah, not not to worry about taking a risk because you yeah. know what the rewards at the end. The book is called Session Man. My guest has been Phil Palmer, the legendary session man. But man, he goes beyond sessions. I like to say from the stage to the studio and back again. Um, what a great conversation! I'm gonna um, I'm gonna play your little uh, reel and then we'll say goodbye at the end of this. One last video for our folks here. Okay, man. Yeah, that is inspirational. You are just truly um, so gifted, and the stories in, in Session Man are so, so fun. As I said, you will get into this book. You won't be able to put it down. Uh, last question, Phil, is you. What question I forgot to ask? <laughs> what question should have I asked, I guess, maybe a better way to put that? Oh, I don't know. Uh... You got me. Okay. Well, you really got me. <laughs> we'll leave it that as okay. a um, um, thank you. I really appreciate the uh, the late night. It's two in the morning for you. Good Lord. I just know that the next time you talk about Dire Straits legacy and you're opening seven bottles of Tignanello, I'd like to be there. <laughs> <laughs> you're welcome, man. This has been All a right. real joy as, as it was yep. the first time. I've really enjoyed yep. it. Thank you so much.